Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'd like to talk about the subject of, is new atheism boring, as discussed by Dave, the distributist, in his video, New, Athe I'm sorry, new Atheism is Boring, Stop It. Now, um, it's a long video and a very good one, and I do recommend that you watch it. Dave's stuff's all good, you know. Um, uh, but because it's long, I'm going to summarize it briefly, at least for me. Okay, so basically he, he starts off with the um, thing, he was a new atheist back in the early 2000s. And um, for those who don't know, Dave is, is Catholic now. But um, he was a new atheist back then, and it, at first it seemed kind of exciting and so on. We'll finally sweep away the old superstitions, and then we'll be able to finally apply reason to come up with good answers to the human problems. And if you know anything about history, this is kind of funny and, and almost a little bit cute coming in the early 2000s, given that this is the same way that you, same thing that you heard in the 1900s, and the same thing that you heard in the 1800s, and the same thing that you heard in the 1700s. And so, um, yeah, I mean, especially the 1800s was real big, especially the late 1800s. So to hear it in the early 2000s as if it's this new thing when it's literally hundreds of years old is kind of amusing. But um, then we looked around and saw that, but like people are going to conferences and stuff, and you know, well, the ideas like you know, how are we to organize society and what's the best way to live and so on, are the really interesting questions to Dave at the time. These aren't the questions that people an were asking. They would would go to th these um, atheist conferences. They had lots of atheist YouTube shows where they just debunked religion over and over again, and um, and so he kind of asked like, well, why? Like that's not interesting. Like okay, you know. God is dead, let's like get on with the actual business of living now, but that's not what people did. And so why? And so here Dave brings in um, the, the Sherlock Holmes story, The Red-Headed League, and uh, it, it's a good story. I'm going to kind of skip this over, the, the basic point he draws from it, because The Red-Headed League is this pretend thing that exists simply to get a, the proprietor of a shop out of his shop, and so, um, so a bank robbery can go on. And so Dave is saying, whenever you see something that serves no purpose and yet people are excited about it, something else has to be going on. And so what is that something else? And Dave proposes that it is something which he uses the acronym HOMI, H-O-M-I, Human Ontological and Moral Innocence. Though um, HOMI is more euphonious, HIG, Human <laughs> Instinctive Goodness, would have been a much more, uh, a much simpler description. Um, what is HOMI? It's the idea that if you strip away all codes of, of, strip away beliefs, you strip away codes of action, strip away the way that people are taught to act, that they will just do the right thing in all circumstances. Um, at least statistically, they'll do the right thing. That like everyone will just get along and things will all be fine if you do this. And so, um, Dave said, it's a, you know, what's, what's the problem with this? It's just completely and utterly false. It has no important relationship to reality whatsoever. And um, worse, anytime anybody who has ever actually tried to put this in practice, because it's a very old idea, it's, it's, you know, there's nothing new under the sun that human beings have invented. And so um, whenever people try to put this in practice, the result is complete disaster. It's bloodbaths, it's tons and tons of murder, because people don't actually do the thing, and so you have to get rid of all of the people who are basically effectively defective um, under this system, and or, and or holdbacks from the previous system or whatever, but you know, you can always locate the cause of why things are going wrong, and then you have to kill them. And then um, you keep on going until finally people get rid of you. So whether you're talking about the French Revolution, or the Soviet Revolution, or, you know, Marxism, or anywhere, basically, that Marxism has ever been actually put into place um, in any sort of real way, what always follows is mass murder. Um, on, you know, one scale or another. Um, and so... It's, it's terrible. Any place you see this, it has always resulted in basically the maximal amount of human misery that human beings generally can achieve. And so why do people keep doing it? And so Dave said, Dave's answer is that it's seductive. Now, um, he doesn't say why it's seductive, but uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. Really briefly, if you look at the people who believe in Homi, who are they? They're generally in the age range of about, you know, roughly 16 to... to early 40s, somewhere around there. Um, you know, currently, your, your younger Gen Xers, your Millennials, and then I forget what the heck comes after Millennials. Um, 
But anyway, like those sorts of people. And if you look a little bit more closely though, it's those people who don't have children. And so what is life like for, and mostly you don't want children either. Um, what is life like for these people? They have no dependents. This is incredibly key. If you look at what life is like for these people, they don't have dependents. If anything, they're often dependent on others, like they're um, often sort of dependent on their parents to one degree or another, but that's not strictly necessary. Um, they will tend to be, the people who believe in homie, again, if you look, they'll tend to be like professionals. They will have jobs that are reasonably okay. You know, you have to pay them to actually do the job, but that said, they, you know, like it well enough, it's not a struggle to get out of bed and go to work in the morning, because work doesn't, you know, for the most part suck. And if it does, they move on to a better job and so on. So what is their life like? Well, basically, they've, they've already been raised. They've been raised, they have habits that basically work with people. They have, you know, at least halfway decent manners. Um, and most of their needs are provided for. And so, you know, they go to work as a matter of course, because they were raised, you know, habitually, you go to school, and then after immediately after school, you get a job. So you're just always going to something for about that length of time at about that part of the day. And so that's kind of normal. You go there and you do some work. And, you know, it's not ideal, but, you know, and then you get paid and you can buy everything you need. All of your relationships are all basically relationships of equals who don't need each other. You know, whether you're talking about, you know, people in stores or whether you're talking about, uh, you know, for an awful lot of them, their therapist, or whether you're talking about, you know, their acquaintances, the people they, you know, may party with or, you know, may hang out, you know, talk with online or whatever exactly, you know, they can afford, especially in the age of Netflix, they can afford to, to um, buy, you know, get the entertainment that'll get them through most of the day when they might otherwise be thinking. And more or less throughout their time, they don't really need much in the way of self-control. They don't really need much of anything. Their instincts basically, like what self-control they need, they've already been habituated to as kids. And so life is basically just kind of, you know, just go and do what you more or less would habitually do in the circumstance and things work out pretty much fine um you know i mean not great obviously many of these people do have you know their therapists need to take their you know various uh, you know anti-depression meds or whatever but you know you do and you kind of get through it and so it, it works out well enough when you contrast this to things like you know massive wars with slaughters and famines and um you know, you know, extremely violent places and so on, it all works out pretty well. As, as human affairs go, it works out pretty well. And so they generalize from this. They generalize from this experience to like, well, okay, you know, life works out pretty well if you just kind of do this stuff and don't get in people's way and don't tell them that the stuff they want to do is wrong. Just let them do it. They're adults. You know, just let them live their own lives. And, um, yeah, it kind of, sort of, vaguely, in this circumstance, works, except for all the exceptions where it doesn't. But in the main, it kind of does. And this is where, if they don't think, if they're not in any way self-reflective, or if uh, they're just insanely self-critical, because uh, anything where if you, you, no matter what question, you know, what input you feed into it comes out with the same answer is equivalent to not having that thing. So if all of your self-reflection just results in, I'm terrible... Well, you can't really pay attention to that answer, and it doesn't vary anyway, so you can't say, like, I'm less terrible because I'm more right here, or I'm less terrible because I'm, like, trying to transcend my base instincts and actually, like, be more th th than just sort of animal me. Um, so they're equivalent there, either if you don't or if you always get the same answer out of it because you're, like, incredibly self-critical. Um, with, without any sort of self-reflection, without any sort of ambition to have people depend upon you in an unequal sort of way, whether it's to have children or, you know, to actually expect to take care of your parents, for example, when they get old, whatever exactly it is, any relationship which is highly unequal, like parent to child, you will recognize instantly that this is not how things work, that you need vast amounts of self-control and what you would really much rather be doing is not the thing that you should actually do. And there are a lot of circumstances in which you should do the thing you would much rather not be doing. That's in unequal relationships. But for people who don't really have much of any of them, they don't really think about this. And so they don't, you know, they don't know, it, it sort of doesn't get in their way. And there's a reason, by the way, these things thrive in academia and having children is extremely, un, you know, not uni you know, universally not the case, but it's fairly common to not have children. In academia and if you ever look at your people who believe 
either um, stuff like, you know, Randianism, um, Ayn Rand's uh, objectivism, or, um, you know, or socialism of, of any form. In general, these are people who don't have children, um, or people who neglect their children. Um, that works too. The, um, but but they're, they're mostly the, the people who don't have children, and, well, they don't think about, like, how much all of this fails. Because, like, all of these failed political systems, Homey kind of just being a premise for a lot of them, more or less would work if everybody just, if no one changed, basically. If everybody was an adult with skills, with habits, and just kind of kept going in this way, on and on, it would all work. And so um, the problem is that's not people, uh, except for like a, a sort of range of time that happens to correspond with when you might be in academia. And so, um, assuming you don't have children. So yeah, so that's actually why this is so seductive, but only to a subgroup of people, but it's so very seductive to them because it enables them to be incredibly lazy, which kind of goes along with the rest of their life anyway, um, if you look at who actually, you know, sort of holds that. Okay, so that's why it's seductive. And what this enables, and this is um, getting back to the distributist video, um, you know, after that explanation, because this is seductive and people want to believe in it, um, the people, and especially in the time period we're talking about, millennials specifically, uh, younger Gen Xers and people afterwards, it's very hard in that time to stand up and say, I believe, you know, credo. Um, like, like in the Nicene Creed, I believe in God the Father. Well, any time that I believe is followed by something that isn't, you know, that, that, um, that is not universally held, and any time it's followed by anything which is in any way controversial, um, it's very hard for people in those age groups at present to actually stand up and say that, or at least for a large fraction of them. You know, I believe in goodness, I believe in love, I believe in science. Yeah, who doesn't? Um... Nobody is going to stand up and say, like, I don't believe in love. I don't believe in getting along with people. Down with treating people fairly. It, it doesn't happen. So, yeah. Okay, so being part of something that was positive was kind of off the table. But if you believe that if you just sweep everything away, what results will be good, well, you can join something purely negative. And here the new atheism was extremely appealing, especially coming as it did in the aftermath of, um, of September the 11th in, in the United States. I mean, obviously, uh, it's not the, quite the same thing. It, basically, um, there are other things going on in other countries at the same time, but the United States had a lot to do with this, even, you know, feeding back into other countries, because a lot of where, you know, British atheists like Richard Dawkins would make their money was in America or even, um, uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens. A lot of those books that they sold were not in England, but in America. And so a lot of the money that they got and a lot of the attention and so on. Um, and the aftermath of it, and, and throughout Europe, you still at least get radical Islam that is, um, you know, engaging in terrorist activities. And so there became sort of a need to denounce Islam, but because of the nature of multiculturalism and so on, you might look racist to do this. And so denouncing all religion is a much safer way of doing it. And so, you know, it's one of the threads that work together with this. But another one of them is what Dave brought out, which is if you believe in Homi, if you believe in human instinctive goodness, well then, if we just clear away everything, then life will be fine. We'll ju we just need to scrape the barnacles off the ship and then it'll just go in the right direction without a rudder or something. And so, um, I mean, it, it's, it always sounds like straw manning it because the idea is straw. The idea is just catastrophically wrong. And so there's no good way of describing it. There's no strong way of describing it because it's a weak idea. Um, so I, it's proponents will always say, oh, you're straw manning it. Well, you know, some ideas are just bad ideas. Um, there's a certain rhetorical defense, actually, and this related, by the way, to the idea of that, the big lie. Not It's not the same as the idea of the big lie, but related to the idea that, like, if you just have an idea that's so terrible that anytime anyone describes it, it sounds like only an idiot would believe in it, it has a sort of rhetorical defensiveness to it, if this actually is your idea, because no one will believe you actually mean this, and they believe, they'll believe they believe you must mean something more intelligent than this, we just don't know what yet, and give you the benefit of the doubt. It's a curious rhetorical move. Anyway, so to wrap up with Dave's video, um, what he said is, so this appealed to these people who couldn't believe in something positive, and in any event just kind of 
don't want anything positive. They just want to scrape it all away anyway. And so this movement with its various universal defeaters of, um, you know, like the, yeah, but that's just your opinion, man, uh, from, um, I didn't do a very good uh, impression of him, but from uh, The Big Lebowski. Um, like, that sort of thing was very appealing for those reasons. And so Dave ends his video with saying that since this is the real issue, homie versus we need some sort of actual rational system and set of ideals that will control human behavior, because human behavior will go very, very bad if you don't, um, we should be having that discussion instead of the, the sort of new atheist, um, you know, debunking sort of stuff. Let's be honest and have the actual discussion we're actually having. Now, the curious thing about this is that none of that actually depends on new atheism being boring. I mean, it's what led Dave to consider it. It's what led Dave to think about this and to search for this explanation and find this explanation. But the curious thing about this explanation is that no way depends on new atheism being boring. All of that about Homie being instinctive to this sort of group of people where life is kind of plus or minus sort of good, just thinking like, well, let's just generalize this. And then wanting to just scrape away everything that sort of gets in its way, figuring that if you do that, everything will just work out fine anyway. None of that depends on new atheism being born. And so it kind of leaves the question, because Dave just sort of took it as a starting point, of is new atheism born? Now, um, there's sort of, I hold that there are two ways essentially in which it is interesting. Uh, the first of which can be seen in my video, The Value of Atheist Hacks. And um, a hack in that sense, meaning um, a person who is a hack, somebody who is, uh, you know, just merely like going through a cant, who's, who's um, not actually thinking, but just sort of, you know, following a kind of scriptish thing, no matter what's actually true, but they say it with conviction, Th that sort of hack. And uh, so I did an entire video, which ironically is a response itself to one of Dave's videos, um, which was about atheist hacks. And so I made the video, The Value of Atheist Hacks. And so one way in which new atheism is interesting to people who are new atheists um, is described in that video. There's another way, and I do have to make a mild preface that if God didn't create the world, then the world was not created according to a rational idea and therefore is irrational. It's, you know, law of the excluded middle. And so um, nothing can be interesting if God did not create the world because the world is not a rational thing that can be understood and therefore you can't actually learn about it. Um, people object, oh, but iPhones, and yes, engineering is extremely useful, but useful is not interesting. Um, I, I'm a professional programmer and uh, another name for a programmer is a software engineer. I work with electrical and mechanical engineers. Engineering is phenomenally useful, enormously useful. It is not interesting. And most of what people call modern science is basically theoretical engineering, um, at least in the way they tend to mean it in these sorts of discussions. It may be ignore, it may be extremely useful. It is, in fact, it's extremely useful. What it is not is very interesting. And you can tell this by the fact that almost all of the new atheists who talk about um, you know, this sort of stuff about like science don't study it. If it was interesting, they would study it. Um, and since this video is about whether or not it's interesting, um, yeah, it's not interesting. So uh, that caveat out of the way, because I'm talking about is this interesting from the atheist perspective, not is this interesting from the Christian perspective. Um, that caveat, so like, yeah, in one sense, you'd have to admit that nothing is interesting, but, you know, you live within contradictions if you're an atheist anyway, because, well, you know, you're actually a human being. God actually did create the world and you're not going to completely deny it. Uh, you're just going to deny parts of it. So, um, but within the atheist worldview, another reason that atheism, that new atheism especially, is interesting is that if you look at what it is, it's not about the atheism. So like, yeah, there, there's that thing about like, if, if atheism is just like, in, in, you know, analogous to not being a stamp collector, well, then it's very open to the charge of, yeah, well, people who aren't stamp collectors don't go to conferences about stamp collecting. They don't go to conferences about stamps. But what do atheists do? They go to conferences where they talk about religion. They talk about religion a lot. In fact, 
What is, in practice, your typical atheist YouTube channel, your typical new atheist book? What are these things in the main? They are bad religious studies. Now, if they had been literally just everyone going around like, I lack a belief. My internal psychological state is that I do not have a belief in God. I do not believe in God. Well, yeah, that would be boring as heck. But no one does that. No, no one does that. No one stands up and says over and over again, I am describing my internal psychological state when I say that there does not exist within my internal psychological state the belief in God. Whether or not God exists, I lack a belief in it. Well, yeah, they don't do that. And, and you know, the very fact that, that sounds like an absurd parody tells you that's not what they do. What do they actually do? Well, religious studies. Bad religious studies. Very, very bad religious studies. But here's kind of the thing when we come to interesting. And the thing about... Now, okay, so in one sense, everything should be interesting. As, as G.K. Chesterton said, there does not exist... There cannot exist in the world an uninteresting subject. All that can exist is an uninterested person. And there is a sense in which that is correct. But there's an... And that's the sense Chesterton meant it. There's another sense in which it's not really correct. And that is... Um, it is very hard for a person to be interested in what they already know. And it is very hard for a person to be interested in something that is trivially, trivially obviously wrong. Now, um, if you look at the sort of religious studies that you see on YouTube atheist channels, or, um, you know, like Bill Maher does on TV. I can't remember the name, or those people he had on. Uh, um, like the ones who, who think that, like, Jesus is just uh, Horus rebranded. Um... Oh, I can't remember the name of this, um, but but the, the one where the founder had this wonderful defense of uh, Jesus and Horus born on the same day when, like, no, they're not. Um, it was that Horus is a sun god, and therefore he's born on every day, so of course he's born on December 25th, too. Oh, that was hilarious. Anyway, um, <laughs> leaving that aside. Okay, but, but it's sort of the quality you very often find in these things. They, they involve knowing none of the history of philosophy, Basically none, with a few tiny little factoids of the history of religion. But, like, look at what they say. You know, it, it, to, just to underscore this point. You know, like, well, why did people come up with religion? It was, it was because they didn't have science, and so they needed to explain how the world works, and so they figured it must be gods who did it. And this explains why the ancient Romans had the god of the doorway and the god of, of the... the threshold of the door and the god of the hearth and the god of the chimney because they didn't know after building the door and the chimney they didn't know how these things were here and therefore they're like it must be some god who did it because i can't remember having built that and i can't remember having built that either so must be a god yeah but they don't know anything about the particular gods that the romans had they don't know they had gods of the, the doorway and gods of the, the threshold of the door and gods of the hearth and so on. <laughs> they don't know any of these things. They've heard of like, you know, Zeus and Poseidon and Thor and, and like, I doubt your typical new atheist has heard of more than about that. And, um, and they're so like, Zeus threw lightning. Okay, that was an explanation for how lightning happens. And Poseidon, there's an explanation for like waves or something. Yeah, that's about as far as they get. And, um, yeah, it's really, really bad. And it's bad in the sense not only of being very wrong, but of being in extraordinarily uninformed. But here's the... Th oh, oh, I'm sorry. And so, yes, that is going to be very uninteresting to Dave because Dave is reasonably well-educated. Er, I'm sorry, Dave is well-educated and intelligent. And at the time, going back, he would still have been reasonably educated at the time. I mean, you know, we're talking 15 years ago, so he'll have learned an awful lot in the intervening 15 years. But as a young man, he still would have been somewhat educated. And moreover, his response to a lot of the stuff, if he wanted to do it, would be to go and learn about it. Being a reasonably, at the time, educated person, he would be in the habit of actually learning more things. So he would go and read and discover and then find out that, like, well, this these explanations for religion are really, really bad. So would this stuff have been interesting to Dave? No, because he's educated and intelligent, especially looking back, 
he's not going to find these things interesting at all because he is well-educated and intelligent. But a lot of people aren't either of those things. And, well, they will still want explanations. They will still want to know, like, why are most people throughout the world and throughout time, why do most people cling to these weird superstitions that don't make any sense to me? And, yeah, there, there are lots of really, really dumb explanations that come up for this, but on some level they understand that, like, human beings didn't suddenly become intelligent ten years ago. And so they want an explanation, but it's got to be a really, really, really simple one that doesn't require any background knowledge. And so when you look at the various debunking sort of things that happen on, on all the stuff that I mentioned, all the conferences, all the things that constitute the boring new atheism that Dave referred to, well, they're not going to be so boring if you're not all that intelligent and you are very, very, very poorly educated. And, um, I mean, and if, the thing is, too, like, if you have any experience, like, if one of these people, um, you know, on the, on the, uh, if one of the atheist channels, uh, excluding Zarathustra Serpent, by the way, um, he, he is in a whole new, he's several barrels above, um, a whole different league. But excluding Zarathustra Serpent, if one of these guys ever does a video about yours, you get some of the dumbest people you will ever meet who do not know anything about science. Like, like trying to actually just carry on a topic on just a scientific, a conversation on just a scientific topic with the typical commenter who shows up and like they don't know anything about science. It's really kind of fascinating the degree to which they, they don't know and they don't, they, they, they don't even care very much, oddly. But, um, yeah, they just, they don't know much about it. They don't know history. Like, talk about neutral subjects with them and you find out they, for the most part, don't know anything about these things. And, you know, ask them. I've, I've done this a bunch of times. I've asked people, like, okay, you want me to prove this? Prove to me that you understand how proofs work. And the, the all the times that I did this, it was like a half dozen, maybe even a dozen. In, invariably, the first step would be like, how do I do that? Well, that's a bad sign. How about you pick something and then prove it? And then they'll ask me what? Like anything. Pick anything and prove it. You know, any non-trivial thing where, where the you know conclusion isn't the premise. And then I'll have to pick something for them. But like, you know, it'll be something like prove that Paris exists. Prove that Julius Caesar was a Roman emperor. And the, what you get back is so bad. So incredibly bad unbelievably bad. But, you know, here's the thing. Half the people on this planet are below average. And remember, God made these people. These people are valuable. To say that somebody is a below average intelligence is not to insult them. It is to, you know, in the same way that half of people are below average height. It's just to describe people. Like, they are supposed to be taken care of by more intelligent people in a hierarchy of being where you have, you know, your geniuses who help the people who are stepped down, who help the people who are stepped down, who help the people who are stepped down, and so on as people are able to condescend, to go down to be with, um, to those who are not as intelligent as them and to, um, to, to go and help them to understand the thing that's higher just as they themselves were helped by someone higher up. Because no human... Um, let's exclude Jesus Christ. Um, no human is at the pinnacle. No human is at the very top. You know, above us are the angels and above the angels are God. And so all human beings have been condescended to and we just, we in turn pass it on as the greater takes care of the lesser. And this is a gift to both. This is the way the world is supposed to work. We all had teachers. Every single one of us have had teachers. Every single one of us have met people who are able to give to us things that we lacked. And so that's how it's supposed to work. So saying that people who are not very intelligent is in no way whatsoever meant as an insult. The problem in this fallen world is that they will latch on to the wrong teachers. They're latching on to the wrong people. But they look around for things that are actually intelligible to them. And then when you see this sort of very bad religious studies that goes on, in the context of, you know, new atheist videos, well, this at least is intelligible to them. Like, the explanations are terrible and very, very false. But at least they make sense in the sense of, like, at least the words in that order have some sort of intelligible meaning to the people who are actually listening to these things. 
So, um, yeah, so in that sense, is the new atheism boring from the perspective of an atheist? And the answer is, if you were a well-educated, intelligent atheist, then yes, it would be. But if you were poorly educated and or of very, you know, of low intelligence, actually it kind of would be interesting because it addresses some very interesting questions. Why are there religions? Why do people believe in these things? These are questions that demand answers. And um, yeah, the New Atheists give very unsatisfying answers. And I think that's one reason why people constantly come and watch again and again and again. Um, you know, in a way that like, you know, look at somebody who's doing something positive and giving a decent answer. So like, you know, if somebody's giving a course in logic, they don't have 500 videos about modus ponens. They have one about modus ponens and then they move on because like the thing being true, it is satisfying and you, you can move on. Um, but that said, um, you know, there, there's multiple explanations, of course. So the, everything I said in the value of atheist hacks is also an explanation for why there are, there are these things. You know, in general, any complex phenomenon always has multiple threads that are sort of tied together into producing the phenomenon. So I'm, I'm here presently only describing one. I'm not describing the, sum, the, the totality of it. But basically when you get down to it, um, Dave's video was correct in all of his conclusions about things like Homie and about um, people who are actually interested in Homie and so on. Um, you see a lot of that in the New Atheist group. You see a lot of that, especially why they turn to Marxism, because basically if you believe in human instinctive goodness, you tend to um, arrive at Marxism partially from there and partially because the things that like lead you to human instinctive goodness also tend to lead you to be dumb enough to think that Marxism is a good idea. Um, but either way, Dave's video basically in its conclusions was correct, but I do think his starting point was wrong and that new atheism actually is interesting because basically in practice, it's really bad religious studies that in, because they are so bad are accessible to people who have no other source for religious studies that they will understand. Um, because the historical accident of most people who were into religious studies tended to be both well-educated and intelligent, and, you know, the vast majority of the population tended to sort of understand their own religion just at a, a relatively intuitive level, with like a, a little bit of learning, but largely just understand it at an intuitive level. And the weirdos who wanted to understand it in much greater depth, and especially abstractly, tended to just sort of be off and talk to each other, and so that became sort of not an exclusive club in the sense of not letting people in, but an exclusive club of if you want to take part in it, well, there's a lot of reading you're going to have to do before you're going to be able to take part in these conversations, because those are the really interesting, you know, conversations to be had. And so, um, yeah, I kind of end up once again saying that Dave's video is very good. It is absolutely absolutely worth watching. He says a lot of very th true things and a lot of his conclusions are true, but I kind of disagree with the premise. Um, it, it is in practice interesting and the YouTube channels and the, the, um, and the conferences and such do kind of actually make a certain amount of sense as long as you can imaginatively stretch to put yourself in the position of the people who actually watch these things and actually go to them. Um, yeah, so um, I do realize, just as a, a final concluding thing, that um, th this explanation will take in, uh, be taken by some as being extremely insulting. But you know what? The thing is, there are a lot of people who are of below average intelligence and, well, they do do things. And this is one of them. I'm sorry. I know that's not like nice to say, but you know what? This isn't tea time. I'm trying to actually describe the real world and the real world includes unpleasant truths in it. And so like, yeah, I'm sorry that I'm speaking aloud one of those unpleasant truths and I'm doing so in, in a like reasonably straightforward way so that my meaning is actually clear as opposed to being very circumlocutive. But, um, well, it's true. Sorry. 
Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.